Hello, welcome to Around St. Thomas and Elgin. My name is Marietta Roberts. I'm the MPP for uh, the Riding of Elgin. I'm pleased to have you tuning in today to uh, speak with three people that do an awful lot of work here in St. Thomas and Elgin. My three guests today are uh, people who deal with the museums in Elgin County, and it's just some of the museums. Sterling Ince is from the uh, Elgin Military Museum. He's the, cur the curator there. I have Mary Durkin, who is the chairman of the board for the Elgin County Pioneer Museum, and Pat Zimmer, who is the museum director for the Elmer Museum. The uh, topic today is going to be talking about Ontario Heritage Week. And Ontario Heritage Week starts on February the 19th. It was first introduced in 1986 to increase the awareness of the importance of heritage and to encourage participation in protection, preservation, and promotion of our heritage resources. This week lends a focus to appreciating the rich diversity of Ontario's heritage. Both the tangible element, that is the artifacts, and we'll have some here today, fossils, documents, the houses that we live in or work in, and the in intangible assets, our traditions, our values, and our beliefs. And it's also to recognize the hard work and dedication of those who contribute to its conservation and development. I'm pleased here today to have these three people to help us celebrate Ontario Heritage Week. And first, I'll start with you, Sterling. Welcome. Thank you. Now, as the curator of the Elgin Military Museum, can you just sort of give us a brief overview of the museum itself and what you do? Well, we deal with uh, the military history of Elgin County. And that's from the War of 1812, when the U.S. and Canada were at war, up until after World War II. So it's our history, militarily, and what our people have done all over the world. I've had a chance to visit, and, it, and it's a very interesting museum. You have very, uh, quite a number of artifacts, and you've brought one here today. Can you explain it to us? Well, this is sort of a favorite of mine. We're getting ready to uh, change over our Navy room and make it more uh, pertinent. And this is a Corvette. Uh, Canada didn't have much of a Navy at the start of World War II. And uh, we needed a lot of ships in a hurry. And they said, what do civilian shipyards know how to build? They know how to build trawlers and whale chasers. So this is basically uh, a, a trawler type of ship, which they've put uh, military arms on board. Uh, a lot of them were built in Ontario. Is that right? Where? Do you know? Old Collingwood, uh, Midland, sailed down the St. Lawrence to salt water and uh, went to war that way. Uh, they're rather small. About how long? About 200 feet. That's uh, about 10 times the length of this studio that we're in right now. I see. So that that's not very large. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a rural background. Yes, I do. You know what Massey mm -hmm. Harris is? Yes, I certainly do. This gun up here, uh, Massey Harris was building those oh. during World War II. A lot of civilian factories went into wartime production, switched from the things they had been uh, used to making. Now, would this boat be used for protection of the various uh, uh, merchant fleets? The idea, of course, was to get goods from North America to England and the continent, and they quite often sailed in convoy. That's a, a group of many merchant ships with a few escorts of this sort, hopefully protecting them. Uh, the main menace was submarines. And this little ship, while it was very uncomfortable for the people on board, was very handy. It could turn short, and uh, on the stern right here, are depth charges. They used to call them ash cans because they looked somewhat like garbage cans. So those would roll off the stern and uh, sink to a predetermined depth and blow up. And on each side, here and here, there were depth charge throwers that would also uh, do in a sub if a, a depth charge got close to it. I notice that there are about four guns on it. Uh, one in the front of the ship. Uh, yeah, the I know pointy that's, end up there. The yeah. pointy end, that's <laughs> yeah, right. right. And uh, then two others, they look like, uh, almost like machine guns. They must be anti-aircraft guns uh, that's, near that's the bridge. Good. Yes. 
These were called uh, orlicons. Or Repeat after me, Orl orlicons. Orlicons, yes. yes. And this was a Bofors. I see, and that uh, the same type of gun? Uh, this was a little larger than the uh, Orlicons, and they were used for anti-aircraft use, or they would fire at uh, a submarine if it was on the surface. Wouldn't do it much damage, but it would keep uh, people's heads down while they were firing at them. How many men were on the uh, Corvette? As they get uh, more technical, they had to have more people on them, mm -hmm. but uh, it would be less than 100. Is that correct? Yeah. And uh, were, are they in use today? There's only one left, and uh, it spent many years as a survey ship. Uh, looked entirely different than this, and they've been trying to uh, convert, convert it back to its wartime appearance, and it's on the East Coast. In the Navy room at the Algon Military Museum, uh, do you have information that many people from Algon County served on these ships? Oh, yes. Is that correct? Yeah. How many do you know? And I any? don't know how many. We're still searching for them. Well, well, then the people who did serve on them should contact you if they have anything. We, we are preparing albums, alphabetically arranged, uh, of people in the Navy, Army, and Air Force, all of the services. But uh, right now, we're interested in the Navy and filling in all the gaps. Were there any other uh, ships besides a Corvette that were used extensively by the Canadian Navy? Well, this was the most numerous because it was easy to build and faster uh, to build. There were destroyers, which you've probably heard of, mm -hmm. and frigates. Uh, there was a corvette named after St. Thomas. Is that right? It was about 50 feet longer than this one, so mm -hmm. out about here, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And uh, being larger, it probably lent itself more to peacetime use. And after the war, it was decommissioned the guns and depth charges were removed, and it was converted into a passenger and uh, freight service ship and sailed up and down the Pacific coast for many years. That's it was scrapped, though. And mm -hmm. as you may know, we have the bell off that ship at the museum. Kids like ringing it as <laughs> they go by. I don't, uh, well, that brings up something. You must have various tours through the museum from time to time. And uh, can you give us some information about that? You wonder how we do it? Or? Well, no, just uh, when you're open and uh, what tours, uh, do you have to have an appointment to take, bring a tour through? Or? Well, we have to lay on some help if there's a large group coming through. Uh, we usually split up a, a busload, say, into three or four parties, and they rotate through the museum, seeing everything but in a different sequence. And we need some of our volunteers in to handle that. So if people call ahead of time, we can uh, get the manpower. And uh, evenings are also available by appointment. Good to know. You brought some other artifacts as well. I did. I'll just please, if you would, drive the Corvette out of here. <laughs> well, that was very interesting to be able to see so close uh, the detail of the Corvette. Who did the uh, model? Hugh Sims, isn't local that, historian. Isn't that excellent? Thank you. This uh, is a finely made device, and uh, you've heard of time bombs. Yes. This is what set them off. It happens to be German, and uh, there's a little window there that uh, shows the setting mechanism. What camera are we using? Do you know? They're, uh, they're on the camera the one, one over here? That's correct. Well, there's uh, one end of the device. And this is to wind it. It's a clockwork motor. It's just a device. There isn't a bomb attached to it. No, <laughs> I've had it set for 20 days, and it didn't go off at the end of the time. <laughs> oh, so we're safe. <laughs> and this actually sets it. So after uh, 45, uh, 50 years, this is still ticking away. And, and it was Very used nice. by the German army, or it was used by all armies? Well, this one is German. I can't read all of the things that it says on it, but... Uh, I suppose everybody had timing devices of different sorts. So that's just one of the neat things that's uh, come in. Where did that artifact come from, do you recall? Uh, a Mr. McCubrey uh, brought it in. His father had disarmed the bomb that that was on. And somehow this found its way into his possession. I think it was called liberating <laughs> items. Uh, a souvenir of some type. Some, some, something like that. Yes. You have one more artifact. One more 
nice little thing. And I don't know what it was, except you told me ahead I of time. I told you, so now you do know. Yes. It's a foxhole cigarette lighter, and the label says Army and Navy Lighter. And it was made by the Bowers Tool and Dye Company in St. Thomas. And where were they located in St. Center Street, uh, corner of Center and uh, Metcalf. I'll demonstrate it here, if possible. <clears throat> that wick pulls up. The idea, of course, is if you're out in a foxhole and the enemy's watching you, you shouldn't show uh, flames. Or they uh, do things to you that you don't want to happen. And when you flick this in the ordinary way, that, uh, see some smoke coming yes, out? Yes, I do. And it's, it's glowing red hot, mm -hmm. and you can light your fag from that. And when you're finished, you pull it back down in and it uh, extinguishes itself. Mm -hmm. And they were made in St. Thomas. In St. Thomas. Yeah. And uh, do you know what happened to that particular company? Or did they go on to do other things or move? Maybe Mary knows. Maybe no, uh, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go on to uh, Mary. You're from the Elgin County Pioneer Museum. I certainly Could you am. just give us an overview then of the uh, Pioneer Museum? Well, as our name specifies, we are a Pioneer Museum, which means anything that of age. I, I understand the newest definition of uh, an antique is 50 years old. I qualify, but they don't want me on display at the museum. <laughs> but we are always looking for anything that relates to our early pioneer days. We have one of the very few homes set up as a home setting. You can go into the kitchen and see the actual tools used in a pioneer kitchen. You can go into the, the city, uh, the lounge or the living room and see the original or very similar furniture. I must admit, I do have a rocking chair of my own, exactly like one that is in the museum, only I get to sit on mine and rock my grandchildren in it. I brought a few things today with me that has come in as a new acquisition. Now, maybe we'll go back and talk about what the acquisitions are about. Well, how do you get your exhibits? Uh, like Sterling, anyone who brings us something to the door or whether they've seen in the, through the paper that we've been looking for uh, a specific item. Now, most of you know that our original home was Elijah Duncan's home. He was a doctor in Elgin County, uh, originally coming from the United States uh, during the Loyalist, uh, shall we say, immigration into Canada. Now, some of the main pieces of furniture from our museum are on display. Most recently, Mrs. Van Leuven from Windsor gave us some more things that have come in from the original Duncombe family. Now, some of the things that have come back, one piece in particular, is the doctor's secretary at which he sat to write all his prescriptions. Added to that, on, at the top of it, is a new um, shall we say, glass top bookshelf. Now, I say new. It was put on in 1900. Mm -hmm. uh, because Elijah Duncan, of course, goes back much further than that. Our newest acquisitions will be going on a new display starting early in April. We change our major displays four times a year. Right now, in our meeting room, our glass cases are filled with the Verda Fisher ceramic collection, all birds from seagulls to robins to um, Baltimore Orioles, all the birds that are native to Elgin County. She made this. It is part of our permanent collection. But right now, we have them on display in our meeting room in lighted showcases for all to see. Now, that will be changed in early April. And many of the larger things will be out. This is a picture of the original Duncombe family. They had 10 children. 10 children. and. Now, this doesn't show all ten No, of them. this just shows four girls. Now, I don't know whether the girls are better looking than the boys or why these particular ones were shown. But I even have a piece of paper telling me which one is which. And we try to keep these specific things so that if someone comes along and says, now who's in that photograph? We have at least an educated guess. Now, these children were Mary, Adelia, Hadala, and Nancy. Do you always have this sort of information available to you when you uh, receive 
No. Or something. Unfortunately, many people bring things in, and it's been in their attic for a long time. Grandma had it before them, and they'd like to have someone keep it for them as a keepsake so that others may enjoy it also. We have things in our home, I know, that have been handed down through the centuries. I'm selfish enough that I'm still keeping some of mine. Mm -hmm. But we always have room for things in the museum. They can't always be on display all the time. And we vary our displays for that reason. Later this year, after the Elijah Duncan uh, acquisitions will be shown, we're having a, a display of traveling boxes. Now, I imagine Pat knows what a traveling box is, but I don't know if you other people do. I think I know. That, are they a writing desk, a traveling no, desk? Well, then that's, I'm wrong. No, <laughs> that is another type of traveling box. The one I'm talking about is usually, a, can be anything from a very small to a very large wooden box that the settlers brought out with them from whatever country they came from. If you come from Germany, possibly it's been a painted box with hand painting on it. Or if you've come from uh, England, Scotland, and Wales, they're a wooden box of different materials. It can be cedar, hence our cedar chest, or hope chest, or hopeless chest, or I don't know when chest, yes. whatever <laughs> name you want to give it. Or they can be made of pine. I have a pine um, blanket box. I have no idea where it came from. In researching it, I would imagine it has come from the old country, and the pioneers would pack all of their best possessions in it. And when it arrived, it would be their only piece of furniture to start with. They would take their dishes and their pots and pans out of it, and that box might become a table, it might become a chair, it most certainly would become a clothes closet when they had a table and a chair, I don't know how old your houses are, but most houses did not have closets. And to store your clothing, there was usually a nail on the wall to hang your everyday dress up and maybe your come to meeting dress. But the box would be kept in order to put away the out of season things or possibly just the clean bedding. Where were you, uh, where were you able to pick up this, these boxes? Are they from Elgin County? A lot of them are. We have one very special one out in the agriculture building and it's completely fitted with uh, a carpenter's tools. Now, I'm not sure where that one came from originally. I would like to say Wales, but I've got an idea. I'll just say the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a broader term. And that man would have carried that box with him wherever he went to work. Now, days, the people don't walk to work, but in those days, of course, they did. And he would likely have a leather strap over this particular box and carry it with him from farm to farm as he went along doing his work in the county. It's very interesting, but you've brought some other artifacts too. Could you sort of explain them to us? Well, this one is a candle snuffer. It also cuts the wick. Sorry. Also cuts the wick as you snuff the candle. And it's on a silver tray oh, as well. Oh, yes. Now, I would imagine it meant came from a very um, well-to-do family. I have a candle snuffer, but mine is just a little cup on a on a longer handle which snuffs the candle and doesn't cut it as that one does. Did this come from the... This is also part of the Elijah Duncan okay. uh, collection. And one piece of information that has been very new to me is that this little brochure that says Mrs. Saywell's Tourist Home. This also came from the Duncan family collection. And at one time it was when they had telephones, because there's a telephone number here. At one time, before it became a museum, 32 Talbot Street was a tourist home. Now, I didn't know that until uh, we were going through these things, because I had not been aware of it. But it gives a map how to find it, and describes the house as a, a comfortable old colonial type. It's just excellent. How um, many rooms do you have on, uh, that you use for display? Uh, we have the large meeting room which houses the changing displays. We have a dining room, the doctor's room at the front of the house, which is very much the same as when he had it, except that those instruments of torture are now behind a glass case, as we do entertain a lot of school children, and I'm sure they'd love to play at some of the tools they see there. And we have the sitting room and the kitchen. Upstairs, we have um, a records room in which all paper documents are kept. 
Uh, there are photographs of Elkin County, some of the early, early days in Elkin County, uh, many uh, documents of all sorts, including weddings and births and so on. Recently, uh, Don Anderson of Anderson's um, gave us a very large map. I believe the date on it is 1882, and it names lots, each individual lot in St. Thomas, who were the original owners of that lot. Now, the area I grew up in was only a field at that time, but there are many of the um, original homes with the names on, and it's a very interesting map to read. I found out there are streets, obviously have been changed, the names have been changed. Uh, some streets were proposed to go through, which never did because of our ravine system, but it's, it's a fun place to look at. We also have a music room and a miscellaneous room. Where do you keep your permanent collection? The permanent collection is kept throughout the museum in the different rooms, uh, depending on where it happens to fit the decor. Well, that's just excellent. Now, Pat, we have some time left for you. And Sorry. Pat is from the Sorry. Elmer District uh, Museum. And you have some things going on in the Elmer District Museum, Pat, you can tell us about. Yes, I brought along one of the projects that we're currently involved with. Uh, this is um, a tribute to the 70th anniversary of the Kinsman Club of Canada and uh, what we have done for our own local group because we have some of the information pertaining to their history within our archives at the museum is we've put together a window display at Hills Pharmacy which the public is invited to view and these particular certificates that we've done up and these have been done by East Elgin Art Co-op student Lois Chilton who is uh, serving a term with us in regards to graphic training and she has devised this particular format to show off uh, some of the people in the community, where they work, and the fact that they are a kinsman. And these will be placed in the businesses throughout uh, Elmer in which the respective kinsmen work. You have a special anniversary coming up, haven't you, as well, Pat? Yes, uh, this is the uh, 25th anniversary of the Elmer fire, which uh, occurred on uh, February the 26th, 1965. And it was a significant event in our community because as a result of that particular fire, there were 18 businesses uh, that were involved and 33 individuals who were actually left homeless as a result of that particular fire. We've chosen to do a retrospect on that fire and the other fires that have occurred in our community uh, dating back to 1909. What has uh, proven very interesting in regards to the public is the great response that we've had from individuals uh, who have uh, loaned us uh, photographs that they took of the particular event. And I've brought along a few of the photographs to show you that we've had enlarged. Uh, these have come from uh, individuals, as I mentioned, within our community. And th this is a picture of, can you this tell us what it's a picture of? That uh, particular picture uh, has to do, again, with the fire, and that shows the uh, main street of Elmer. This would be looking west or east, sorry. And this was taken the day of the fire? This was actually taken the day of the fire when the Elmer volunteer firemen were fighting the blaze. This particular one also was taken the day of the fire. This uh, reflects the uh, south side of Talbot Street uh, looking uh, west. And this particular photograph, which is an excellent one, uh, shows the uh, province of Ontario Savings Bank, which was uh, at one time located on the uh, north uh, west corner of the um, town's main intersection where the incident occurred. And this last photograph shows the um, This is propane. after the fire. Yes. This is the propane truck that was involved in the uh, explosion. And also behind it was the city service uh, t oil tanker that was involved in, in the explosion as well. Are you uh, celebrating it in, in the community itself? What is it this We're, the town of Elmer done? Well, actually, what the town of Elmer uh, has been very gracious to do is we're going to have a plaque unveiling, recognizing the spirit of the community and the efforts that it took to rebuild the core area of the business community. And that will take place on Monday, February the 26th uh, at uh, 1 o'clock. The actual ceremony begins at 1.15, and that will be at the Royal Bank, which is located where the province of Ontario Bank was located, which is our main corners. And the uh, museum will be having its official opening for its exhibit, Burning Memories, on uh, February the uh, 25th at 1 o'clock, and the public is cordially invited to attend. We have lots of activities planned for the entire family. You have uh, a building, the Elmer and District Museum, and it's a very special building. 
isn't it? Can you explain that to us? Well, this particular building is actually a result of a gentleman who was unable to obtain cement during the war years, and he went uh, to a different area and uh, dismantled an old cement block brick house, brought it back and built the structure that we house the collection of the community within. And this was done during the 1940s. And it's really bits and pieces of the past uh, in uh, refitting the it to a museum, uh, since it was originally a secondhand furniture store, uh, different uh, portions from different places within the community were used to create the effect and give the atmosphere that's needed within a museum. Well, thank you very much, Pat, and thank you, Mary, and thank you very much, Sterling, for coming today and joining with me for Around St. Thomas and Elgin. I invite all of you to return and join with me when I speak to various community leaders and community groups, and we talk about things that go on around St. Thomas and Elgin. I also would ask you to remember that next week is Ontario Heritage Week. There are many museums, many historical societies, much to see here in Elgin County. So thank you very much for tuning in and see you again around St. Thomas and Elgin.